mind, uh, Professor Watson? Sure, sure. I'm I'm ready when you are. Yeah. We are ready. So let's begin. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's uh, Bengal Club Library Talk. We have a very distinguished uh, speaker today, Professor Shobhoshachi Bhattacharya, an eminent physicist who is, however, going to talk about a subject not frequently thought to be the preserve of physics, twice born, the two phases of the Bengal Renaissance, a scientist's view. He studied at the Mitra Institution, Bhavanipur, the Presidency College, Kolkata, and the University of Delhi. He received his doctoral work at Northwestern University and postdoctoral work, and did his postdoctoral work, among other places, at the University of Chicago. He primarily works on the dynamics of disordered many body systems. He spent two decades uh, at corporate research labs in the US before returning to Mumbai as the director of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He currently serves as director of TCG Crest in Kolkata, co holding the C.V. Raman chair at Ashoka University. Is a fellow of the American Physical Society, was a visiting fellow commoner at the Trinity College, Cambridge, and has also briefly held the Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bosch Distinguished Professorship at the Presidency University, Calcutta. He is also, and this is a matter of great pride for us, for those who don't know, a member of the Bengal Club. Before handing over to him, I'd like to request you to send in your questions by typing them in the chat box, which you can see in the panel below. And uh, I'll read out some of those questions uh, to him to respond after his talk. Please, if you can keep the questions short and limit yourselves to one per person. Over to you, Shukhuja Thank you. Um, what do I do to get the screen to myself? Just click on it. Yes, sir. Just click share screen and then you can... Uh... Oh, that's because there is something on my screen. Uh, well, I'll get back to the screen. Uh, you can all see me? Yes, we can see you oh. and the screen. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Shalajish Babu, and thank you, Umadi, uh, for the invitation to Bengal Club. Um, I'm also a member of the club, and I never thought I would have a chance to speak to... Um, Bengal club people about a subject like this. Um, it wouldn't be, um, uh, you know, uh, all of you would uh, recognize the irony of speaking about Bengal Renaissance in Bengal club, which is housed in the, in the house that Lord Macaulay once had. So it's a rather interesting coincidence. So let me just uh, say that I am um, I'm not uh, a historian by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, what I uh, will try, you know, physicists, when we give talks, uh, we have a rule. And the rule is, uh, like, goes like this, that first you uh, tell them what you are going to tell them. Uh, then you tell them. And then you tell them that you have told them. And this way, you know, the people who get bored with knowing what you are going to tell them has an easy escape. And, uh, you know, now that we are online, you can get away. Uh, now, so let me just tell you what I'm uh, going to talk about. Um, what I'm not going to talk about is perhaps easier to say, and that is I'm not going to talk about whether Bengal Renaissance was really a Renaissance in the sense uh, that Europe had a Renaissance, because Europe re Renaissance, um, uh, the historians define it in many, uh, many different phases. There is Renaissance, there is Reformation, there is 
um, scientific revolution, which is almost synonymous with uh, enlightenment. There is industrial revolution. There are many, many phases. And one could, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to just squeeze them all together as one phenomenon. Because in India the, and in Bengal in particular, uh, we had gone through all these phases, but these phases were um, extremely um, complex, interwoven, and happened primarily in a colony. So there are some special aspects to it. And as I go along, hopefully some of this will become obvious. So let me uh, start uh, with uh, the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So um, the word twice born, I will try to explain. Uh, it was just a name that came to me. The two phases of the Bengal Renaissance and these phases have a general meaning in common public and that is phase is a kind of a phase in time, you know, the, um, ages if you like. But phases in physics has another meaning, so I use both meanings uh, in this. For example, water and ice are the same material, but they're in two phases. So I start with this picture. Many of you know this picture. And um, in other places, I have to explain what this is, but I'm assuming every single person here knows what this is. This is College Square, the old Senate Hall, Hair School, residency in the distance, um, uh, old Hindu, Sanskrit collegiate school, etc. But the most interesting thing is these two characters in the front. And you might imagine that they happen to be there by accident. And I'd like to prove to you that that is not the case. Um, so before I do that, I have to give you a disclaimer. And this uh, disclaimer comes from John Robinson, which is anything one can rightly say about India, its opposite is also true. So within that, uh, constraint that everything I'm saying um, has an opposite and in fact uh, having an opposite makes things much more interesting than not having another version. So let us see where we go with this picture. So this picture, uh, by the way, I see someone on my screen, Arijit Choudhury, uh, he is trying to enter the waiting room. Um, a couple more. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Bhattacharya, we and will take care of it. Uh, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so there are four pictures. Very interestingly, every picture is um, uh, named incorrectly. Uh, on the left is Senate Hall. Uh, on the right is Presidency College, which is called uh, University of Calcutta. Presidency College on the bottom. Hindu college, uh, which is primarily uh, showing Sanskrit college. But the most interesting thing is that you see these two characters, oops. These two characters are these two characters. So they are basically props, okay? They have been asked to move from one corner of uh, college square to another corner of college square and this um, this is a rather um, well-known feature of uh, uh, the colonial or the imperial uh, photography. And I suppose what the idea is to show that these architectural gems that uh, hang around have uh, hardly anything to do with the land in which they are and has almost nothing to do with the two figures which are right in front. So this is one of the key, uh, not so subliminal message that um, uh, you know, was centered on the justification of subjugating an extraordinarily large number of people and essentially robbing them 
uh, quite uh, thoroughly for over 200 years. So this, this, uh, this mythology uh, continued for 200 years, even till independence. So first, I think that what I wanted to say is that European um, Renaissance, and by that I do not mean the regular Renaissance, but rather some blue lines are appearing mysteriously on, are you seeing them? Yes, yes we are. Okay, anyway, never mind. You can, you can still read what I'm saying. So the point is you don't have to go through the, uh, go through the list, but this is, um, uh, there was a, uh, they, I found this list interesting in the year 2000, they said, you know, who, who are the top 100 people of the previous millennium? 1000 years and this was a poll and uh, some uh, you know some uh, very eminent people uh, opined on the final 20 the final 20 was not done by poll and first thing you notice is um, that nobody in this is pre-european renaissance um, and the first uh, person is not even a person, it's a machine and the inventor of the machine, Gutenberg, who for what we know was a very um, polite and humble person and he would have been horrified to have been placed over Isaac Newton. And as far as we know about Isaac Newton, he would have been horrified that any human being could be placed above him. Um, so, uh, interestingly, uh, we have, and we are the only non-Western country to have one person that had the Mahatma, and rather peculiarly, he just follows Hitler. And this juxtaposition is jarring, and the, and the people who came up with this said that they are um, extremely, extremely upset that this is how it came out, but this is how it came out. It was important people, not good people, uh, you know, rich people, popular people, nothing important people whose impact was great. So in that sense, the European larger Renaissance, which lasted, you know, several hundred years, many hundred years, 500 years or so, uh, does mean something. Okay. So now what I do is I take off on a tangent. Okay. And it's um, sort of because I'm giving the talk, I'm doing the choosing. So I uh, give you two different histories. Uh, this, uh, I call it a brief history of modern times. I start with the Renaissance, then Gutenberg, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Galileo, Copernicus, Shakespeare, so on and so forth. Then the Protestant Reformation, I'm counting it as, as uh, Renaissance. Martin Luther, then comes Newton, Dalton, Faraday, Darwin. Then in red, I have industrial revolution. There are other revolutions, French, American, and Bolshevik ones during this entire period. But under industrial revolution, which I consider the most important event of perhaps last thousand years and continues to be that is uh, James Watt who did the steam engine. Uh, we all read the story of the boiling kettle and uh, a little known French engineer who lived uh, not uh, more than 36 years, um, Sadi Carnot. And from this uh, steam engine came the foundation of a subject in physics, thermodynamics, without which I think um, we have uh, you know, progress simply uh, is no longer possible or was no longer possible. So this is my choice of this, this period. Then I come to India and I have uh, chosen a completely different set. Aurangzeb dies in 1707. Um, at that time, India was founded by David Hare and Ramohan Roy. Then there are other places. Things are happening very rapidly. Wilson College in Bombay, Presidency School and College in Madras, 
civil engineering in Roorkee. Uh, civil engineering is important to recognize. We can come back to it. And the Bengal Engineering College soon thereafter, our College of Art and Craft and so on. Then comes the mutiny. And then the British Crown assumes control. And the, everything that follows is not the company time anymore. It's the, it is the empire. So cultivation of science, Mahendralal Sarkar and Eugene Lafont forms it. Uh, you can read independence movement begins, partition of Bengal, Tata Steel starts in Bihar, Hind Swaraj, 1909. Um, and IIS, IISC is founded in Bangalore, a collaboration between Jain Tata and Swami Vivekananda. Uh, we'll come back to it. Uh, first Nobel Prize to India, uh, for those who care about Nobel Prizes, you know, we know who got it. University College of Science in Calcutta, Ashutosh Mukherjee and Prabhupada Chandra Ray uh, were responsible for putting it together. Then Jallian Wallabag Massacre, second Nobel Prize to in India, uh, happens in physics, and that's Sivi Raman. Indian Statistical Institute, by Mahalanabis, which happened in Presidency College in Calcutta till they moved out. CSIR labs happen, um, you know, were created by Bhatnagar the same year there is Bengal famine in 1942. 45 onwards, um, there is a, a large number of science institutions are created. And at partition independence, we have 17 universities for 300 million people. So this is sort of the uh, situation there. So what is Bengal Renaissance? So um, I gave it a year. 1828 is the year where Sati was abolished. So I just um, gave that year. And 1992 is when Satyajit Rai passed away. And Sham Benegal uh, made a comment in Times of India that Bengal Renaissance began a long time ago, it ended today. Um, rather sharp statement, but um, nevertheless, we will explore to what extent, uh, you know, commonality or dissimilarity exists. Here I put four pictures on top and four pictures in the bottom. Martin Luther, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, you might say kind of similar in spirit. Um, then, uh, we have Erasmus on top and Vidyasagar. Vidyasagar's range is perhaps somewhat larger. Um, Shakespeare, uh, and because I didn't want to put Rabindranath, I put um, Michael Madhusudan Dutt. On the other hand, on the extreme end, Galileo or Jagadish Chandra Bose. It was just kind of in not saying one is equal to the other, not saying um, anything else. It's just broad brush stroke as to what might be the reasoning behind calling it a renaissance. There were institutions. So Hindu college between Raja Ram Mohan Roy and David Hare, whose statue stands within the college. He was a Scottish watchmaker and a friend of Ram Mohan and they put together the college. Indian Association Cultivation of Science, Mahendralal Sarkar and Eugene Lafont. Then the Bose Institute in 1917, Jagdish Chandra Bose and Sister Nivedita. So these were, I'm talking mostly about science angle as to how things are changing. Uh, so there are many other things are happening and I'm not touching on them, just uh, pref you know, sort of more talking about scientific institutions, scientific people. So here is something I'd like to tell you. And this is uh, Mahendralal Sarkar was a doctor, as you may know, that he uh, says something and I thought um, I, since our reading uh, thing didn't work out, I'm saying that uh, until men learn to, what he says is until men learn to respect each other's honest convictions and until they're free from all prejudices, in other words, until fearless of the consequences of discoveries in the fields of knowledge, they cannot be said to have become civilized men. 
the one thing that can secure this blessing is knowledge. And when he passed away, Father Eugene Lafon, in his um, tribute to Sarkar, said that the agents of the colonial power wanted to transform the Hindus into a number of mechanics requiring forever European supervision, whereas Sarkar's object was to emancipate, in the long run, the, his countrymen from this humiliating bondage. I bold, the bold of emancipate is done by me, uh, because in, emancipation is a big and strong word, and we know it from other, uh, you know, other contexts that they thought at that time that through knowledge, through science, one could emancipate is a rather uh, interesting statement. Thinking about how even you know, hundreds of years, uh, years later, if you are not a scientist, how you think of science may be somewhat different. Then Rajendra Lal Mitra, who is to be called um, uh, an Orientalist, uh, before Orientalism was no longer a very respectful word. And he said that let every step of science education be explained by experiments for science to be effectually learned, should be learned in the laboratory, but do not attempt to make your institution a school of technical education in the industrial arts under the misnomer political science, in practical science. Okay, so I'm still on physics. And, uh, and this is a picture physicists adore, and I know many people who keep this picture on their wall, in their offices, reminding themselves uh, how high can high be. In 1927, there was a Solvay Congress where anybody, everybody who was anybody in science uh, attended this. And on the front, there were 11 people. 11 is an odd number, which means there is a center. And the center is, of course, this person. And he knows it, and you know it. And uh, it's rather clear. And uh, Madame Curie is here. Uh, Heisenberg is here. Pauli is here. Schrodinger is here. This is Niels Bohr, Max Born, and so on and so forth. This is a great, great picture. This is known as the Solvay picture. There's another picture. This is Kolkata 1930. This is also known, but not equally known. And I'll just identify, this is Jagadish Chandra Bose. This is Meghnath Saha. This is Gyan Chandra Ghosh, who became the first director of IIT Kharagpur. This is Satyendranath Bose. This is Devendra Mohan Bose, DM Bose, who was, the, was Jagadish Chandra Bose's nephew. And I now put them together. And in the year 1930 in Kolkata, there were these four, at least they were physicists, and then uh, Raman and Krishnan were there, and there are six of them. And that's about 20% of all of Europe, and perhaps only Cambridge had more representation in this picture above. And this is just to say that during this period of what we call Bengal Renaissance, uh, the science in Bengal, uh, remember it's not a Bengali renaissance, it's a Bengal renaissance. Uh, if you count these people, um, uh, we have had uh, the, you know, a 20% share of the world's best. And in fact, I can replace six people from there and put six of them up there. And it will increase the you know, average IQ. So these were, this is a, an extraordinary phenomenon. This is the high points, um, probably among the highest points of Bengal Renaissance. And surprisingly, physicists or scientists or even non-scientists rarely talk about uh, the Bengal Renaissance's science as perhaps the crowning moment of Bengal Renaissance. Why it happened, how it happened, etc. are speculations and perhaps Q&A will be the best place to do it. I just wanted to show you where they're located in the city of Calcutta. Uh, Asutosh Mukherjee and I uh, don't want to tell you very much except that his batchmates were Acharya Prabhupada Chandra Ray and Narendranath Datta who later became Swami Vivekananda. It's, it, it's some class and um, you wish that you had a class like that. Um, and he did many extraordinary things. 
uh, in fact, he created a research university. And it's not just science. He brought in Pali, he brought in, um, you know, many subjects, Islamic studies, um, ancient Indian studies, all kinds of things. Basically created the first modern research university in India. Now, I have to come, so if things were really that good, um, where did we go from there? Okay, and this is where the departure between the European initial Renaissance through uh, Reformation, Enlightenment, etc., and Indian, uh, uh, you know, history differs. On the back, Bobazar Street, which was the home of IAC since 1928. I can't vouch for the picture being from 1928, but that's where. Bowaja Street was. And on the right, Bowaja Street, roughly today. And uh, those of you who know Bowaja Street, um, you can think of this uh, discovery of Raman effect in 1928, and it seems completely impossible. Um, and here I quote from S. Chandrasekhar, uh, reminiscing. He said, It's a miracle. And then he says, it gave a false picture that making discoveries is easy. It had a distorting effect. I mean, it was all right in the 20s, but extended into later period, it wasn't. I started with a totally glamorous view of science that persisted so long as I was in India, but going to England was a shattering experience. Okay. Around a few years later, Chandrasekhar wants to return to India. And K.S. Krishnan, in his letter, tells him not to do so. And uh, this is a rather, uh, a, you know, mind-boggling phenomenon uh, that, uh, you know, someone like S. Chandrasekhar is asked by, who happens to be Siviraman's nephew, is asked by K.S. Krishnan not to return. Okay, so something must have gone wrong what must it be? And again, I think it was better fleshed out later in discussion. I'm just giving you some, uh, some, something to chew on and perhaps give me a hard time later. Okay, so I'm not going to read this, but uh, if it is going to be available on YouTube later, you can read. Four people came to India uh, two, three people came to India during that period. Andre Vail, uh, one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, came to Aligarh Muslim University. Max Bond went to Indian Institute of Science. And there are extensive records of his letters to Ernest Rutherford and to Einstein. But the one to uh, Rutherford is the more interesting. And uh, the third one, everybody knows, is J.B.S. Holden. And in my limited reading, I found that the insight of these three people who came from outside the country about the state of affairs in India, um, once uh, Indians began to control, you know, post Ashutosh Mukherjee India, uh, when we began to control the instruments of education and academics, things started to go wrong. And I will make a, um, uh, a statement here because I think that for me, this is the biggest challenge uh, to un understand is how could it be so if Europe uh, could go on, um, you know, from one victory to another, how is it possible that we very quickly slipped back down, if uh, that is also a matter of controversy? Um, and uh, uh, my tentative argument is this, that we got British style institutions, those pictures of by uh, Mr. Frith reminds you of that, but we got governance structures of our own. And I like to call them the Gurukul system or the Gharana system. 
because we didn't have a system of governance of our own. And institutions of a kind, with ideals of a kind or mechanisms of a kind, did not respond rather well with a governance structure that is not our own. And in my judgment, nobody um, understood this more than uh, the usual person, Rabindranath. Anyway, so um, I just want to end on a different note. And that is that there is a parallel and second, you know. So when I said twice born, I said in time, but um, I couldn't figure out the correct English uh, word for born too differently. A second version to this Englishman's uh, recurring view that we are not worthy to govern ourselves, there is another rather major um, uh, course of action began it, with a different philosophy and for lack of a better word I'd like to call it revivalism and that is while Mahindralal Sarkar and all they were on uh, the progressive chariot they wanted to get on it as soon as possible become their equal gain enough knowledge and then show them that in their own field we were their equal. Then there is another argument and that is we were always your equal. In fact, we were better than you and which is probably also true in many, many, many ways. I showed you that 1750 gap in, um, in uh, Europe's contribution to to physics knowledge, for example, or physical knowledge, where India was not dark, China was not dark, and most certainly Arabia was not dark. Um, Arabia had an extraordinary flowering of knowledge during these dark ages of Europe. So uh, revivalism of India's glorious past resulted in a struggle between the conservatives and the progressives. And it is the most intriguing part of Bengal Renaissance. And how does one deal with it? For example, in my mind, the most intriguing person in this whole debate is Swami Vivekananda. And, um, um, and we'll get to uh, it if questions come that he initially wanted to be a part of the Brahma Samaj and he used to visit Devendranath Thakur. Times it seems that the echoes of that unsettled and uncom con uncomfortable coexistence rings even now. We have never been able to come to terms with this way of, you know, self-assurance that we are just as good as anybody, uh, and we have not been able to do so very well. And the Bengal Renaissance uh, gave rise to both of these. Um, the progressive one that we normally teach students in school, but the other one. And, uh, you know, there is a, a story with which I, uh, um, I would like to, um, perhaps uh, I have one more slide to talk about. Um, uh, Meghnath Saha uh, went back to Dhaka, where he's from, and his uh, father's neighbor said, so what have you been doing lately? And he had just done the uh, Saha ionization equation, and the Royal Society made him a fellow and all of that, and he tried to uh, explain it to his um, uh, neighbor. And he said, you shouldn't waste time doing all of these things. And then in Bengali, of course, this was in Bengali, he said, Shobi Bade Ache. Then um, Saha being the way he was, he kind of wrote something saying, Kiki Bade Nai. So, you know, this, uh, uh, I, I just say it, 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 it some, sounds kind of funny, but um, uh, I suspect that it is not completely gone, that shobi bade ache. 
So now, uh, you know, uh, we can talk more. I'm uh, 10 minutes over the limit. So let me just uh, end by um, this statement that past is never dead. It is not even past. This is a very famous quote from Faulkner. And so the question is, what exists now? You know, if we say that Bengal Renaissance is not there anymore, as Mr. Uh, Sham Benegal says, and we all have a sense that the glorious days are behind us, then what stays? And uh, people of my generation, you see, I belong to the Midnight's Children generation, a little later so, uh, side of 1947. And uh, we had seen people, we had seen people, known people, who were undoubtedly, in our mind, Renaissance people. And, um, you know, in this whole matter, um, historians are usually the best guide. And I end with a, uh, is there some way? Okay, great. So this is an obituary of Professor Rashin Dasgupta, the great historian, by Professor Tapon Rajoudhuri, another great historian. And uh, he says that there was an outburst of intellectual and literary activity in 19th century Bengal, which the region's intelligentsia fondly described as the Bengal Renaissance. That description has been voted out of court as too flamboyant for a very limited class phenomenon. I do not know if this is true, but this is what he says. Perhaps rightly so. But whatever the correct nomenclature for that splendid efflorescence of creativity, it produced a particular kind, type of individuals and intellectual ambience. Serious scholarship combined with wide interests social concerns and sociability, sociability and a strain on, on unobtrusive skepticism. I think each word has been thought through, which could acquire heroic dimensions were among the hallmarks of Bengal's intellectual culture in the 19th century. And there he agrees with Sham Benegal and says Oshin Dasgupta belongs, was among the last representatives of that tradition. So, you know, this is a matter of history. And I, I think that, um, uh, you know, one has to take uh, this uh, statement uh, rather, um, I think this is rather well presented because our generation actually saw this, um, uh, saw what we could imagine to be the residue of of um, the Bengal Renaissance. So I have said random things, uh, focusing a little bit more on physics and science and and um, uh, and their accomplishments. And um, uh, if you want to know what on the top, JMK on uh, IEN and who are these SBs and SR, you can ask me later. But I'm well over time. I'm very sorry. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm done. Thank you very much. And I would request uh, the audience to type in your questions in the chat box that you will see in the center of the panel at the bottom. So as I wait for those questions to come, Babu, I had two questions of my own. One is that you titled this talk, uh, Two Phases of the Bengal Renaissance. So mm -hmm. am I correct? in interpreting that you said that the first phase lasted from the 18th century to about 1928, and then uh, the second phase comes later. Is that right? And if- No, 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 no. If I type 1928, that's wrong. Uh, it should be 1828. Um, uh, so 1828, you see, uh, Ramahun Roy was born in eight, uh, 1772 or 74. I have heard, seen both versions. Um, he died in 1934 in Bristol, I think. Um, so I needed, um, needed a, a date, uh, which is a beginning. You couldn't say that as soon as Ramon Roy was born, Bengal Renaissance was born. So I just wanted to pick a date from his life. 
1828 is the abolition of sati. So right. I picked that date. Now, twice born uh, is uh, the twice born. Um, you know, I I regretted the use uh, twice. So it is uh, so two different. I mean, multiple ways I can give you two. Okay, one is that unlike in Europe, Indian um, Renaissance or Bengal Renaissance, if you like, uh, came in a completely different historical situation. We recognized, or some of us, the progressives, like the types of Mahendralal Sarkar and so on, recognized that we need to be on that bus. That bus is already very far ahead. You can't almost see it, okay? So you get into this mode of getting on the bus. And miraculously, if you did, and through them, a few others did, okay? Not nearly the number of Europe, but nevertheless, they did. Once they did, then they had to contribute. You just couldn't have a free ride on the bus, okay? And you have to put in your petrol into that bus. And for example, you know, Jagadish Chandra Bose, Satyendranath Bose, Meghnath Saha, uh, others. Okay, I just showed you that picture showing six out of, you know, six in Kolkata and 29 in Europe. You know, it's a miraculous thing, just as Chandrasekha says, because, uh, you know, that fraction, it's, it's a, you know, it's a statistics of small numbers. You could say that, well, there weren't too many people, um, you know, whatever it is, but it is nevertheless true. So I think that that picture is worth pondering. Okay, so um, 1928, I didn't mean. Okay, so now time-wise, let's go back time-wise. Time-wise, I would say the two phases of Bengal Renaissance is one is jumping on the bus, and the second phase is putting petrol in the bus. Okay, so this is, if you like, two times, you know, twice, okay? And both are remarkable achievements. Getting on that bus was not easy. Okay? And it's not often thought of uh, as a remarkable achievement. Now, you know, we can go on. I can give you all kinds of uh, stories as to how this has happened uh, and what might be the reason. There must not be one reason, might be a confluence of reasons and we can argue about that. So that's one. The second one, I think, is that if you were told you were not worthy, how do you prove you're worthy? One is you show them on their turf that you are their equal. Or you define a turf in which they don't belong and claim that that turf is equal to their turf. Okay, so this is a second arm of Bengal Renaissance, and I mentioned Swami Vivekananda because, you know, well, this is getting into very difficult territory because here is someone who is a monk, okay? He wanted to become a Brahmo. By the way, I should point out that both uh, Ramon Roy began the Brahmo Samaj and Satyajit Roy's family is Brahmo, and the picture in between that I didn't want to put in, also happened to be a Brahmo. Um, uh, and Brahmo Samaj had made incredible contribution to the Renaissance, far greater than their numerical number would suggest. So leaving that aside, if you say that what else had happened, what else had happened is that we looked back in our tradition See, if you have seen the Kailasa temple in Elora, you don't need to be convinced that we knew how to build structure, okay? But in, in the area of thought, what is it that we had that was equal, okay? So uh, Vivekananda was, you know, in some sense recognizes, because there's a very interesting story with IISC, um, we can get into that. 
he implores Jain Tata to build it. On the other end, he's a Vedantic, right? How do you put them together? Right. You know, normal people have difficulty. And I cannot imagine that he didn't have any difficulty. But, um, you know, he must have, must have been a very great soul to be able to kind of Synthesis. manage all of it together. Yeah. So sorry about these long answers no, no, to fine. your two innocent. No, no, that's fine. absolutely. Is, let me ask the next question, which is from Partho S. Can Bengal go through another renaissance? Uh, what could be the few things that, if carried out, can bring back the glorious days? Well, you know, I, I mean, of, of course, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know. Uh, what the what the future holds in Bengali or in Sanskrit called adrishto, because you can't see it, you know, not drishto. So I don't know, but um, I'll I, I'll just say that you know. So um, there is a a, a, a um, Thomas Kuhn wrote um, a very influential book called Theory of Scientific Revolutions. And there he argued that science does not move incrementally. It moves in leaps, which he called paradigm shift. Right. Okay. And perhaps the question is motivated by some thought of that. Um, I have no idea what, what, uh, uh, what the future is and um, uh, so I uh, cannot say what uh, is needed uh, for it. Um, I can give you a laundry list of what is not needed for it. Um, you know, just go out, uh, have a walk in 15 minutes, you will, be, you will find, you know, 20 reasons. Um, now, um, one thing I would venture, now please, uh, please take it a little um, bit a, with a uh, pinch of salt, that I think that you need a project, you know, a national project, because a renaissance is not a one person deal. You know, a single Michelangelo. Um, so uh, during my time in presidency, Amulis Tripathi uh, wrote a book called uh, Renaissance Ebong Bengali Shangshkriti. I'm probably not remembering the title. And he goes through in rather great detail about the differences between the early parts of Bengal Renaissance. And he concentrates on the European definition of Renaissance, not the whole thing, the little thing. It's not so little. Da Vinci was there, Michelangelo were there. But nevertheless, it's a collective. Uh, uh, phenomenon that happened. Now he described the differences between Medici and you know our lords and so on and so forth. So what I would say is that uh, you know you remember French Revolution had already happened when our young people are learning about these things. They are not only learning Newton, they are also learning uh, Voltaire, they're learning Rousseau, they're learning all of this. And I think that equality must have occurred to them as a hugely important uh, goal. And I think a kind of budding freedom fight or independence, gaining independence must have provided some kind of ba you know background uh, you know uh, background that that uh, Tapan Rai Chaudhuri mentions. Um, so you know, I mean, in the 1960s, you know, you will remember. I'm old enough to remember that it was just centenaries after centenaries after centenaries. You know, I mean, they're just huge number. And um, so, um, yeah. uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I have no idea whether there could be a Bengal Renaissance. I mean, if we did little things like did our own duties, uh, 
a you know renaissance may not happen but a livable existence can and uh, the next question is possibly related to just that and maybe what you said earlier that if you go out and <clears throat> for 15 minutes you will know what are the things not to have to have a renaissance so this is from monish dutt he says how do you explain the lumpenization of bengal following such a renaissance possibly unique in the empire can you i missed one word can you just i know so i should yes of course how do you explain the lumpenization of bengal following such a renaissance possibly unique in the empire i'm going to say something that most of you will not like um uh i suspect uh i suspect that uh, you know this is now a physicist talking about something it does not know anything about okay but just you know trying to use the way a physicist thinks of things um i would say that lumpenization coexisted with renaissance okay uh, but in a very small way and you wish to know for example the background in which this happened happened to a different economic class different part of society read um, um you know uh, uh what's his name this day's names um go hutom pacha naksha okay and you will you will find uh, hundreds of examples of lumpens except that they are wealthy lumpens and um so you dare not call them lumpens but they are alaler ghorer dulal by tech chat thakur right um they must exist dl roy's literature uh, the uh, one poem we had to read in school called nondolal Uh, so nondolal is a phony freedom fighter right so mm, you know uh, he uh, makes a caricature of these phony freedom fighters so you know from a distance you know it lends enchantment to the view and we think that all freedom fri- fighters were great but these freedom fighters leaving school must just be you know some of them just be happy not going to school you know it is possible uh, he wrote a song that when uh, we were young we used to sing um called um, reformed hindus jodi jante chao amra ke amra reformed hindus amader chene na ko je he is surely an awful goose amra reformed hindus you know so you know dl rise sharp eyes did not locate these but this is a different class of people in society different you know financial status etc which is why we do not call them lumpen but they were perhaps the ancestors of people who we do call lumpen they were probably not important uh, the next question is from smita can the impact of the bengal renaissance be extended to the whole world as well sometime into the 21st century i think she means to ask that whether you know the effect goes on see um i would say no how can it happen i mean you know see for example um um i i i i think my simple answer is i do not see it to have any impact outside of india this is some kind of a uh, you know grandiose view that we sometimes harbor about ourselves um europe on the other hand uh, had managed to work out i'm sorry to say perhaps you know sucking our life blood um the you know i i point i say that of all the things that happened 
the thing that completely separated us from them was the Industrial Revolution. You know, the rest of it were manageable, but a, an Industrial Revolution and not having one was not manageable. Okay, so if you give your coal and your iron to them, comes back from Sheffield as your knives and forks. Simple economics tells you that you cannot beat that. It's just not possible. So if Bengal Renaissance, you know, if, if, if what Tapan Rai says about uh, Oshin Dasgupta and what, um, what uh, you know, he said about um, uh, Satyajit Ray being the last of the Renaissance people, um, then it has not survived even it's in its uh, own soil. Right. Could it, you know, have uh, fruition in a different place? It's possible. Uh, you know, I, I always like the idea. Many of you read the read the book, and many of you seen the movie called "The Name of the Rose," Umberto. and uh, uh, by Umberto Eco, and it's uh, it runs around uh, the notion that Europe had completely lost the philosophers. By philosophers means the Greeks, okay, and Greeks were kept by the Arabs. They were gone from the face of Europe. So it came back to Europe through the Arabs, you know. So, so you know, such examples exist. But, uh, you know, if I'm going to put money on it, I'm not going to put money on it. All right, let's finish up with another question that I had, uh, which you referred to during the course of your talk. It was Chandrasekhar saying that in India, he found uh, science very glamorous and then when he went to England he was shattered or tormented or something like that. So what could have happened or, or what was he referring to that that disturbed him so much when he landed in England? Uh, yeah, that's the most mysterious sentence uh, in, in that whole book and um, I like to put it on because I would also like to understand what did he really mean and I think that if you look at the uh, miracle of the 1920s, okay, um, many of my friends will correct me later and they can unmute and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, um, I think the Saha ionization equation, okay, so let's just uh, okay, go back to Jagdish Chandra Bose. 94, Jagdish Bose starts millimeter wave work in presidency college. Um, he doesn't win a Nobel Prize, but you know, it's, it's completely irrelevant, but it's a great piece of work. Um, he also built extraordinary instruments, uh, all of that happened. But in the 20s, uh, Meghnath Saha wrote the, um, um, the Saha ionization equation. Around 21 or so, he visited Satyendranath Bose and gave him the Planck radiation formula and say, Nobody can make sense out of it. You have a very bright mathematical mind. See what you can do. And out comes the Bose statistics. Okay. Uh, Raman effect. Uh, Raman, I like to point out to everybody that Raman um, discovered Raman effect in 1929. Uh, sorry, 28 on 29th of February. It was a leap year. Okay. So therefore, Indian government decided that 28th February will be the science day. Otherwise, we have to wait four years to have a science day. Now, in 1930, that is within a year and a half, he wins the Nobel. And he knows that he will because he bought the ticket for the uh, ship. You know, it's a well-known story. And two years later, Werner Heisenberg of Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle wins the Nobel Prize. Paul Dirac and Erwin Schrodinger waits for another year. So if you think of how incredibly improbable it is for Raman to have discovered with his exceedingly limited resources, almost the irrefutable proof of quantum mechanics. Okay, 
it boggles the mind you know you just say that look you know probability has a distribution and in the very tail of the distribution there are numbers very small numbers but there are numbers and raman happened to be such a such a tail at such an end so um okay so based upon all of these uh, activities that must have gone on in india and chandrasekhar was no uh, you know nobody's fool and he extremely brilliant man came from raman's family um and saw people making earth shattering discoveries right left and center he might have thought that oh you know it's a, it's child's play you know i i can go and do it too but uh, but 20s and 30s are different a huge amount was learned in the 20s huge amount and 30s onwards uh things became harder perhaps and then he goes to cavendish where perhaps half the world's greatest minds are sitting every day and then he begins to realize how tough it is because the problem he is thinking about they do are thinking about so that's what so shattering to him i i don't know i don't know i but you know he he spoke uh, in in very uh, in not so very easy ways but i think that he's uh, you know he began to recognize you know that he needed to be much more humble humility you know because how difficult it is to make discoveries until uh, and the more more mature the field gets that makes perfect sense uh, uh, that it, it's uh, that, that's my interpretation but i don't know exactly what he meant no, but no. it is the most intriguing line in that entire conversation in the book thank you very much uh, professor vatcharya and i'll shortly hand over to uh, my senior colleague in the library committee professor choitali bhatt uh, moitro uh, to deliver the official vote of thanks but before i do that i must thank uma bi uh, who has uh, made this possible uh, and uh, so my thanks to her uh, choitali bhi if you'd like to take over from yes. here yes of course pleasure good evening everyone it's time for me to thank professor shobhoshachi bhattacharjo and at this particular moment i am joined by each and every library subcommittee member and the chairpersons of the bengal club for this very engaging talk just a proof of the immensity of his knowledge his in depth clarity and thought about issues which we partly know and we partly try to sort of understand but in the last hour and of course with the questions from the erudite audience we must thank him for giving us the scientists view of history by connecting different timelines achieving a very synergistic effect and also establishing indicating the superiority of india thank you professor bhattacharjee for your effort it seems we can keep on asking you questions about one bit of your talk there is so much to learn from this thank you again and again good evening thank you goodbye very much. Thank friends you very and much. goodbye good night bye 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 bye